So you've been running a business literally longer than I've been alive. I was born in 1998. Yes. Um, and I started my business when my kids were six months old. Brian was six months old. Jonathan was three. And I was working for a company, good company, but I cried every day. I dropped them off at the daycare. And I'm like, you know, I really need to do something different. I need to do something where I can stay home with my kids. And the ultimate plan was to homeschool the kids, which, you know, we ended up doing that. And so um, I started a business in Mary Kay Cosmetics. And I started out just part-time, but I worked super, super hard, kept my day job. And after about a year and a half, I was able to quit that full-time job stay home with my kids. And that was my sole source of income for years and years and years. And, um, you know, throughout all of that, uh, we were able to homeschool the kids. We did our schoolwork in the mornings. We ran deliveries um, and errands and play group and all of those fun things with the homeschool group in the afternoon. And then I really focused my attention on my clients in the evenings and weekends. And so that, that went on for years and years. And then the kids decided that they wanted to go to public school. They wanted to play sports. So I'm like, okay. So I put them in school, and then I found myself gone working my business when they were home. And the opposite was true. So I was like, oh, I need to do something a little bit different. So I still do have that business. It's just I just maintain a core set of customers right now. I'm not really in the building stage. But I know that when I retire from what I'm doing now, I can always kick it back up and get it back up to the – the glory days. I was driving the free car. I've won five diamond rings and for mm. my sales. And, you know, just it, it, it's it's just really something that, um, like a lot of people, they, they'll start a business and it can go through phases. And so um, so whatever season those businesses are in is really, it, it, it helps you as a person to know, hey, I can, I can go back and do that some more. So mm. how do you know you're in a season and not a bad business model or decision, you know, just a bad business for you? If it stresses you out to the point where you hate it, you know, you, you don't like what you're doing, then you probably need to reconsider because that is one of the things. Um, you know, running a business is not easy. It's not, there, there's a there's a little uh, saying that says, yeah, you can work a business part-time. You just pick which 12 hours of the day you want to work. You know, so it's not where you can just go, oh, I think I'll do this today and then I won't do it tomorrow. You really have to work consistently. But when that starts to drag you down and you're not happy anymore, that's when you might just not be in a good place. Or when you say it might be a bad business model, it might just be not a good idea. There, You may need to have some more revenue streams or some things, or maybe you're at your capacity to where you can't grow, you can't hire anybody. Um, you really need to be looking at your financials to see, is this worth it? I mean, could I be going out and getting another job and making more money or at the end of the day being happier? Mm. Yeah. So how do you advise your clients on picking a good model? Do they come to you with, how does that process work? If someone's oh, listening yeah. right now and they're like, oh. I've heard all kinds of ideas. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard some really good ideas and I've heard some really not well thought out ideas. I won't say they're bad ideas because one thing that I learned early on is I can't tell up front if someone's going to be successful or not. There are too many variables involved. Yes, we do want to look at the market and that's one thing that we do. I advise my clients, you do some primary market research where you're getting out and you're learning what customers want. Okay, what are the needs of the area? So that's one, do your own market research. And then we can do secondary market research. We can get the numbers, the, I, I call them the cold, hard data numbers to say, okay, there are this many people in this trade area. And last year they purchased this much in this particular industry and there are this many competitors. Therefore, is there more room for more or not? Okay. A lot of times Russellville and a lot of different industries in Russellville are just at the saturation level because we're, you know, we're not really big. And so, um, you know, so my advice to them there is, you know, you need to be doing something different. You know, that competitive advantage, that unfair advantage, something that your competitors are not going to be doing. You need to learn about the competitors. You need to cyber stock them, go to their places of business, understand what they're doing and what you do, do, do differently so that when you say, I can't, I want to compete in this arena, you can say, well, I, I do this differently than that competitor. So maybe there's some new markets there. And so between that 
primary market research where you're getting out and you're finding out what customers want, and those those secondary market research with the data numbers, that is really a good place to really look to see if it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. You know, does it fit the area? Um, a lot of times I get people in my office and they'll say, well, there isn't one. Nobody else is doing this. And my first question is, why? Why is nobody else doing that? People have done that in the past. Why are they no longer doing that anymore? And the the cold, hard truth is a lot of times the community just cannot support that particular business at the level that it needs to be supported so that every, you know, you can pay your bills and pay yourself. Mm. So that's, so you got to kind of look at all Mm. of those things. You think, is there any value looking at markets bigger than the one you're in or just different ones? Yes. um, A couple, couple of different reasons to look at them to see what they're doing and how they're being successful, that's one. But then also, you might want to place your business in a bigger market. And, and you know, one of the easiest ways to place your business in a bigger market is to, to go online. You, know, mm. you can have the, the home base or the um, in town or whatever, but expanding those markets and looking for those different revenue streams, a lot of times it's just a matter of going online to get those bigger markets. Oh, yeah. Tap into a lot of things there. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you're allowed to say this or not, but w- what are the, the best, as you can see, like the maybe the best businesses to get into over the next five, 10 years around here in Arkansas? If you just had to make an educated guess. Hmm. I haven't really thought of that. I've, I've seen a lot of trends coming around. Um, I would say look for something that is... I can't use the word recession proof because there's really not such a thing, but something that people really need, something that that, that, that they consider a necessity. And to, to sum that up into one or two types of businesses, I really have to think about that for a few minutes because, um, again, it's really hard to know what's going to work and what's not going to work. The other thing, I mean, something for particularly for Russellville, I mean, we there is a a niche for um, with the new entertainment district and the possible casino coming in and, and some different things in the entertainment area for tourists coming. You know, we've got the eclipse coming. What are they going to do while they're here? We've got all these natural things, but um, what else will they be doing? So, but again, those types of businesses are tied to the economy, and if the economy is dipping, which it is forecast to do some more. Um, then you don't want to have all your eggs in one particular basket. So, um, you know, yeah. I would just say necessity. A lot don't, of s- don't invest hundreds of thousands in the eclipse before the crowd gets here. <laughs> exactly. I think exactly. there's some people out there doing that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so too. But I think the, and I've been involved in quite a few of the town hall meetings and spoke at some of those as far as the eclipse goes. And and it's really for any anything that draws people to the area, um, any type of tourism is they're going to need gas, they're going to need food, and they're going to want something to do. And so those particular businesses will, will do well with crowds. Um, but when the crowds go away, the business still has to support itself. Mm-hmm. You mentioned trends a minute ago. What is a, a business trend? If you just had to define it. Business trend? Um, well, something that I'm seeing is I get a whole lot of people wanting to do the same thing. And that's what I'm referring to as a trend. So for for example, I, I was joking because at one point I had, I don't know how many, probably a half a dozen clients with 3D printers. And they were like, okay, I can do this. I can sell the plans. I can do, I can m- build this. And I actually had a couple of them do some very interesting stuff. And actually, I've got one um, that's actually gotten in with a national uh, sporting goods chain for something mm-hmm. that he came up with. So, you know, and having that idea that can be scale, scalable, that's another thing that, you know, um, you have to be able to be able to grow and not just be at your full capacity, um, not making money at your full capacity, you know, because mm. then what do you do next? Well, you have to hire someone to help you or expand, which takes more money. So, but trends, um, right now I'm seeing a whole lot of um, people who have worked for in the construction industry going out on their own, doing some different things like that. Um, and a lot of times what we see are people creating jobs for themselves. You know, so there's entrepreneurship in a couple different fashions. One is where I just don't like working for that 
person anymore or that company anymore, and I can do this on my own. I'm just going to make myself a job. Okay, and that's kind of how my business is. You know, mm. it's not that I don't like working where I'm working. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying what I'm doing, I can just do on my own. Okay. Now, and then there's the other kind of business where, like you said, it's a hundred thousand dollar investment. You're going to need employees. You're going to need large amounts of capital. Those are job creating businesses, and not necessarily for the owner. Because in those types of businesses, it's smart for the owner to not so much work in the business as to work on the business and growing mm. and building. And so there's there's a couple different models there going on. Mm. Sounds like the one where you're, you're taking the investment exposes you to more risk potentially. Absolutely yeah. does. And, you know, one of the things that you had asked me was, um, you know, what, what are some of the biggest ma- mistakes that new entrepreneurs make? And the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs do make is underestimating the amount of cash they're going to need. Um, it takes money to make money. There's a lot. There's a lot of misinformation out there about grants being available just for any kind of business to start. Not true. Um, not saying that there aren't grants out there. There are some. They're mostly designated for for nonprofits, um, education, cities, municipalities. That's infrastructure. That's kind of where a lot of the grants lie. Um, in fact, we're grant funded. The ASBTDC is grant funded. Okay, so that we can offer our services at no charge. But um, but so there's this misconception that it doesn't take a whole lot of money to start a business. Well, I will say that there are a lot of businesses. I've helped startups, $500. They can start their business because they, they've got some customers. They kind of know what they're doing. It's not a big investment. But they always underestimate what it's going to cost to run a business and how much they're going to bring in. Um, I work with clients all the time doing financial projections, and uh, they'll they'll send me these, yeah, I'm going to do $10,000 every month starting from month one. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> so first of all, um, you don't usually see sales in that way unless you have contracts. Um, but the sales start slow. You know, even if we're very conservative in our projections, it's still hard to hit those initial projections sales-wise. Even if we're overestimating our expenses to some degree, things always happen. It's kind of like if you've you've ever tried to remodel a house or had some vehicle work done or something like that, it always takes three times as long and three times as much money as you thought. And so same is true for for a business, especially getting started. Um, You have to have enough money in the bank to cover those things that if you don't hit your projections or if you, you know, your rent goes up, you weren't expecting it or the utility bill is high or whatever happens. Um, So underestimating the amount of cash. And then the biggest reason that small businesses go out of business is a lack of cash. Mm. Just, just simple. Um, Not having access to enough capital, you know, having that line of credit or that money that they can pull from that rainy day fund. And so, so I usually do advise my clients, you know, uh, if at all possible, keep your keep your job while you're doing this. Um, that's also going to help you get a loan where they see that money's coming into the household so that they don't have to, you don't have to rely on the business to support the household initially. So, um, so again, uh, biggest mistakes, not enough cash. And then, um, you know, not learning enough about your industry. That's the other thing. Um, you know, uh, I said I get I get I've gotten some people into my my office oh yeah I've been one of my first questions is how long have you been doing this you know how much experience oh um I want to open a restaurant and I just have a good recipe yeah have you cooked for 200 people every day six days a week do you know it do you know how to order food I mean I don't I wouldn't know how to order that kind of Mm -hmm. you know for recipes and stuff but then I get the other ones in there um you know, I had a man in there the other day, and he's like, well, yeah, I've been doing this for six years, and I've got all my own tools, and I've got people who really like my work. And, you know, and that that is a good mm-hmm. way to get started. Got some cash in the bank, got a good credit score. He's going he's gonna to be okay, you know, but... Um, some people some sometimes people just the, dive into it too early, and sometimes okay. the dr- <laughs> the dreams are bigger than the bank account. So that you know that is that is one thing that's super important is um, to have your own money. You know, yeah. even if you're trying to get a loan, banks want to see you've got skin in the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah I, I started uh, very, I rushed myself into it because mm-hmm. I was caught in this rut at that point in my life where I just wasn't making the progress I wanted to make. And yeah, I just went straight in. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't need a loan though. I mean, the business model I chose, very little money yeah. to invest because it was all, it was just a service business. Right. Online. But it did not work out like I thought it would. I thought, oh, I'll be making ten thousand dollars a month in three or four months, you know. And no, no. It took it took a while. It takes a while. It yeah. takes a while. And, and, and I mean, even then, like it flexed their seasons to it. Yeah, and and kind of going back to those projections, um, and they'll say ten thousand dollars every month, and I'm like, mm, it's never going to look like this. And you do have to know your business cycle, like you said. And so, for example, um, just a real obvious one would be like someone who does landscaping. Okay, you can you know when their busy season is, May to October. They're pretty much going to be tied up mowing lawns. Okay, so what are we going to do in the winter time? So maybe we do firewood. Maybe we add Christmas lights. Maybe we start trimming trees. Maybe you know maybe we get into some other things. So having all of those different revenue streams does help, but still you know it does take time, and it's not uncommon for a business to take a couple years really to get up to break even point and paying the owner. You know, break even point is usually a little bit faster unless there's big expenses involved, but being able to pay the owner, that's that's always a big deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who's eligible to, you know, become a client of the ASB T D C always Yeah. Yeah. Always After eleven years I still do get stumbled up on the name sometimes. Yeah. The Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development mm-hmm. Center. Um, ASB, TDC, anyone who has or wants to start a for-profit business in the state of Arkansas can come to a center. There are nine centers across the state, all hosted by um, universities, educations of higher learning. Um, but you don't have to be an alumni. You don't have to go oh, no. to school. No, you don't have to be a student. You can be a student. You can be alumni. But really, the, most of my clients that I see, um, they come to meet with me on campus, and they have never been been on a on at Arkansas Tech before um, and just kind of the kind of to give you a bigger picture so if you've got some listeners that are outside of our area um, the ASB TDC is part of a national network of small business development centers and therefore there are uh, small business develop cen- development centers in every state plus Puerto Rico Guam and some of the territories and such um, so Really, anybody in the United States who has or wants to start a small for-profit business can obtain services at no charge. And I say small, and I kind of air quote that because it's the U.S. Small Business Administration's definition of small. And just to kind of give you some scale of that, um, a construction company can have 500 employees and still be considered small. Hmm. A farm can have up to a million dollars in annual revenue and still be considered small. A women's clothing store can have up to $30 million in annual revenue and still be considered small. So a lot, those size standards really are larger than what I would consider small. And so a lot of people, a lot of businesses don't realize that they're eligible for services. So I'm glad you asked that. Hmm. So for profit and small. And then an overview of the services you kind of specialize in. Okay. So our services mainly are around uh, our, our no cost small business uh, consulting and, and then our market research. We also have um, workshops that we, that we do. You know, I teach QuickBooks, marketing, um, you know, AI tools. I don't teach, I didn't teach that one, but you know, there uh, we have speak, we get guest speakers that do those, but but the, um, the consulting can be really on any topic. And so say you're wanting to start a business, we would typically talk about, you know, your experience, what are you going to do, what are your revenue streams, how are you going to fund the business, um, and if that funding needs a bank loan, we can help with the business plan, the financial projections. And I usually help with financial projections whether they want to do a loan or not, <clears throat> excuse me, simply because you need to have an idea of what that looks like. Um, how are you going to market your business? Who is your target customer? What is the, what does, like we were talking about earlier, what is the demand for those types of that product or that service? And so we have these conversations to try to 
get a, a, a plan in mind and some steps for steps to move forward. So say, for example, I've got a client who's, you know, they're like, like I said earlier, the, the man that was in construction for so many years, what's next? Okay. So now, um, let's talk about marketing. Okay. Are you going to have a website? If so, who's going to build it? Um, if you're going to build it yourself, I have some workbooks that can help you. Um, are you going to use a marketing agency? What, what are the social channels that you want to use? You know, all of those things, um, that come along, are you going to need employees? If you're going to need employees, let's talk about the, your employer requirements. So really I kind of go back to a catchphrase that I like to use and that's the business answers people. And so really any question that you have for a business we want those questions because then even if we can't give you the answer, we can point you in the direction. I've got um, a couple clients or more than a couple that do government contracting. And there's another agency in the state of Arkansas that they are the experts in government contracting. And so I usually refer my clients over to them. I'm still going to help you with your business entity setup and, you know, making sure your tax, your financial projections and your financials all look good but I'm not the expert in government contracting or exporting. If you want to do those things, there are other agencies that can do that. So, but we are um, the hub, if you will. Hmm. Amazing, amazing. So there's definitely, if you're starting a business anywhere around here, you need to get a hold of them, mm -hmm. meet with Rhonda. And um, how, how often, sometimes I feel like, uh, maybe, maybe this is not something I should feel, but sometimes I, I, come, I came to you with a business idea, like a hangboard deal. Um, several years ago. And that business idea really didn't go anywhere. You know, I, I was thinking about it. I came to you, talked to you about it. And then I decided for whatever reason, you know, it's not something I'm going to pursue. And for a while, I kind of felt a little ashamed of that. Oh, don't. No, don't. So I'm, I think that's something other people probably feel when they come up with a business idea and they don't see it through for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. and people that they told about it, they're like, oh, man, no, we gotta I, go. I would advise not to do that because I have seen, I have worked with client after client that and sometimes I go, okay, here they are again, you know, <laughs> but it's okay because if that one doesn't work, let's, let's look at something different. And, and it kind of goes back to that core, those core characteristics of the entrepreneur. Okay. So obviously you're in business for yourself. You've gone through a few different business models. You're young, you're successful, you're doing these things. So you've got a lot, you've got those characteristics. You just needed a little bit of guidance. Okay. And so that's kind of my job. Um, when I give someone, ask someone to do something for me and they respond and get right back to me, dependability, that's one of the characteristics we need. Responsibility, um, uh, resiliency, you know, that idea didn't work. Oh, but what about this? Um, I've had a couple people that I had this one lady and I, actually I can, hmm, I don't want to get into specifics because of confidentiality, but um, because everything that they tell us is confidential, but this particular mm. late, this particular partnership pair of ladies, they uh, they came to me um, and they have signed a publicity release. But they had one business idea that I looked at and I'm like, oh, I'm like, I don't think the market's big enough for this, you know. And they're like, oh, but we found this building, we found this space, it's perfect for this. And I'm like, you know, let's, let's kind of take a step back and let's look at this and let me pull some numbers. And I never tell someone not to do something because I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if it's going to work out or not. And a lot of it goes back to those, those core, um, values and characteristics of the entrepreneur. Some people will crawl through glass to make something work. Okay. Some people give up easily. You want the people that will stick with it and do it. Well, anyway, this pair of ladies, um, they came up with this idea and I was like, oh, I just don't know. But so we went through the numbers and then they just kind of fizzled and I'm like, well, okay. And then she came back to me later on and she came up with this brilliant idea and I'm like, oh my gosh. And we actually featured them on one of our client's stories. Um, and they are, uh, it's, uh, um, or, uh, I'm trying to think of the name. It's, oh, uh, the Southern Sippery Mobile Bar. Okay, so they've got hmm. this. They've got this trailer. They named Jolene, and they're taking this trailer from doing events. They've got bartenders, and they go and do all of these events, and they're very successful doing that. Well, then they were having trouble 
finding a place to put their trailer and all of this stuff. And they were really just looking for a place to park it and put their stuff. Because, uh, you know, one of them told me, she said, I'm tired of my dining room looking like this. I've got all this stuff in my garage. My dining room's full of my, my um, you know, glasses and stuff like that. And so they found this space and they're like, you know, I think we could do something else with this space. So not only did they get a place to put all of their stuff, but they, they opened a, uh, a venue where they can do parties and... Um, and they've also got a co-working space in there, too. So oh, wow. when they're not using, and this is in Moralton, and this is called Orinwood Hall and Southern Social. Orinwood Hall is, you know, if you want to have a baby shower or wedding reception or whatever, you can do that in the evening. And during the day, the, the Southern Social is op open for co-working. And hmm. so, they use, so they have those characteristics, okay? And they were thinking outside the box. They were trying... They were trying to solve a problem and actually came up with a new revenue stream. And I've seen that over and over where, where clients are trying to solve a problem and they, they actually um, uh, solve one of their own problems, but then they actually are able to make some money off of it too. And I've got mm -hmm. another client I can even think of doing something, not the same, but the same kind of concept where they're mm -hmm. going, okay, we need this. Hmm. If we're going to have to pay for this, why don't we just do that and then bring in some extra money doing it? So it goes, kind of goes back to those characteristics of the entrepreneur. And that's why I never say, oh, that's a bad idea, Tal. You know, if you can find a market for it and you can afford to do it and we can, we can figure out how to make some money on it, hey, that's fine. So kind of back to your initial thing. So I don't ever, it doesn't bother me when somebody comes back to me with a different idea. I do like them to tell me, oh, Rhonda, I'm not doing this anymore. So it's not just kind of like this unanswered conversation that we've had where it's hanging out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I tell my clients, you know, I really need to hear from you because I don't know if you're doing great, if you're not doing this anymore, or if you're stuck on something. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, it doesn't bother me at all. And no one should feel bad going to the ASBTDC with different ideas. Um, just tell your counselor what you're thinking so that they kind of so that they can change directions with you and and not be you know still back here thinking that you're going to do that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to reach out to those people with, that launched the co-working space in Moralton. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do here. And you know the market. I, I know that you've looked at that regarding this idea. How is that market? Yeah, and it, and it's not a thing that has been it hasn't been done here. It's there are a couple things that I know of in the works, but. Oh, you, it's it's yeah. it's one of those really difficult industries to assess because there is no real good data on it. So, for example, um, when I look at those cold hard numbers that mm -hmm. I was talking about, I go to I go by NAICS code. Um, you know, it's industry code, and so co working spaces is in the same NAICS code as someone who rents out residential properties or commercial space. And so that could be the guy that owns the warehouse over there charging $2,000 a month for his warehouse for someone to use it. You're, well, you, it's all lumped in there together. There's no way to separate that out. Mm. And so I cannot get that particular data myself. But again, that's where you go out to that primary market research where the business owner or the person thinking about it is going out and talking to people and know, getting to know people and saying, hey, you know, um, I hear you thinking about starting a business. Where are you going to be located? Well, I can't find any space. I just don't know. I guess I'll do it from home. But again, the dining room problem. Um, I don't want my dining room table all tied up. So, you know, talking to enough people, doing those customer discovery questions, um, what are the pain points? That kind of goes back to the entrepreneur to get some of that data. Um, you know, yeah. how, how many people bought a certain particular item over last year in this area, I can get that, but mm -hmm. some of the stuff I just really can't mm -hmm. put Talk my finger people. on. Yeah, what was that book? Talking to humans. Uh, yes, is... talking to talking to humans. I can't yeah. remember the the actual the author of it, but it's an ebook, and um, we have permission, and I've sent it out to numerous numerous clients because it gets them not only it gets them out of their comfort zone and talking to people, gets them out of their head, gets their idea out there and the intent is not to sell someone on your idea. The intent is to find out what the pain point is mm. and 
what problem can you solve? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, I wouldn't recommend you just go, hey, I'm going to have, I mean, you could do this if you're really ready, but hey, I'm getting ready to have this co-working space. Okay, but again, um, that's marketing. That's promoting. Um, customer discovery is behind the scenes, and it's more having conversations with people about, you know, when you start, like I said, when you start your business, where will you be located? Is it going to be a problem? I was on a call the other day with someone, and it was a professional. I can't even remember who it was. And there's dogs barking and kids screaming in the background. And, oh, I was I was placing an order online, my my shopping cart wasn't working, so I picked up and called the 800 mm. number of a major, major department store. Mm. And I'm hearing dogs barking in the background. Well, guess what? <laughs> that's not a good, that's not a good concept. So if you want a more professional, you know, maybe, so maybe when you're talking to people, do you feel like the space that you have at home would be professional enough? Mm. Or do you want people coming to your house? And there are probably some city ordinances, well, depending on where you live, well, that will restrict people coming to your house mm -hmm. for business. And so that's kind of what you're looking for when you're assessing this is getting out and asking those people those types of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you'll be pleased to know that actually later today there's two separate individuals coming to just talk. We're just going to talk to them, you know. Good. Not sell them on anything, but just mm -hmm. figure out what's going on and what their problems are they're facing. And what their expectations are too, yeah. you know, and again. And that, that'll give us... I mean, if their problems line up with what we're able to solve, that'll also give us the, the marketing messaging, you know. Exactly. exactly. what pain points to dial in on. And there is, I don't know, I'm only going to comment on what's been publicly put out there online, but there is another large, that I know of, space that is like a co-working space coming to Russellville. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. You know, mm -hmm. I've gotten to talk to them, and they're doing some great things. And the reason I want to talk about this is because the day that I saw that on Facebook, there was, there was this moment. It was like right in the morning, someone sent it to me. There was this moment of like, oh, no, <laughs> they beat us. You know, they yeah. have so much more resources, mm -hmm. a huge space. They're great mm -hmm. people. They're going to kill it. It's just like defeat. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, a few moments later, I'm like, okay, okay, hold on. They're big. And yeah. it's a lot bigger than us. And with that comes a lot of advantages, but they're also going to have disadvantages. We're going to be able to move way quicker, pivot, mm -hmm. um, and with some of the other things we have going on here, like hopefully we'll be hitting a different niche, right? A much smaller niche, right? Right. Um, and and you know, you they may not want that particular atmosphere. So again, it goes back to mm -hmm. what are what are your what is unique about what you're doing? Just like it, you know this from marketing, and you know I'm sure your listeners do as well. But you know what makes you different? You can be bigger, you can be better, or you can be different. You're not going to be bigger. That's fine. It's fine not no, to be we're bigger. Not gonna be bigger. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, you can be better in certain ways, but you can definitely be different, have a different atmosphere. You can also look at your pricing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. and I always tell my clients, you don't want to be the most expensive, but you don't always want, you don't want to be the lowest either. Let Walmart be the low cost leader. You know, mm -hmm. you want to be somewhere up here and to where you're, you're not the most expensive, but you can, you can justify your pricing. You yeah. can justify, you know, why no are you more? Why yeah. are you more? Because we've got this added value. We have this equipment if you wanted to do this. We have that. Yeah, which is where, again, these conversations that we're having later today and throughout the week with individuals will come into play. Like, what is the value we can add to them? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be very targeted in our... Um, Hopefully, if, if it goes according to... It never goes according to plan. <laughs> well, that's okay, but you, you know, you don't know until you try. Yeah. And, and that, that's, another, that's kind of another one of those lessons for the, for the entrepreneurs. You know, you don't know till you try. And so a lot of my clients, sometimes they'll come in with these grand ideas that are, that are bigger than the area. And I'm like, let's just, let's just scale this back a little bit. You know, let's look at these numbers and let's see if we can dip our toe in it first and see if this is going to work. And then we will have a plan for expansion later on. You don't have to go in guns a blazing from the very beginning that's a lot a lot of people think that you have to do that but you really don't mm. um, you can start smaller and grow yeah. yeah when I when I first started out which isn't that long ago a few years I was much more impulsive mm -hmm. uh, I just made made decisions and I felt like I had to be to a degree because I was in this rut but that's definitely cost me some things mm -hmm. had some failures from that 
but gotten a little less impulsive now. And yeah. It just probably comes with age, you know? Yeah. And, and w- one thing, though, something that a true entrepreneur um, does have is they're not risk averse. They're not afraid. And so what you're ca- might be calling impulsiveness might just be not afraid of the risk involved. Yeah. You know, so yeah. who knows? Depends on what decisions you actually made. I who, don't knows? Know. <laughs> who knows? Well, if you have a business idea, you definitely need to go see Rhonda at the ASB TDC. Mm-hmm. Got it right. Got it right. <laughs> Got it right. And the, the best way to reach me um, is I really, I like to talk to folks before I just send them a form. Um, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about the intake process, if that's okay. I do like to um, understand what a, what a person's um, idea is just a little bit, you know, just give me something to go on. Um, I like to understand if they know how they're going to fund it. You know, a small home-based business, you've got some savings, great. Let's talk. Um, I've got a $2 million idea. I, my credit score is 530, and I have no savings. I'm sorry you're not ready to talk to me yet because there's nothing we can do with that. We're not going to be able to go anywhere. And so feel free to uh, uh, give me a call, 479-356-2067. I'll say that again, 479-356-2067. And so after I talk to someone and we say, yeah, you know, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and meet. And I'm not p- picky about who I accept. It's really just, are they ready for my services? Because, you know, I've only got a certain number of hours every day. Um, then um, if we're ready to move forward, there's just a quick online intake form. Everything that client tells us is confidential. And they fill out that form. I send them a link to my calendar. We can meet by phone, video conference, or in person at Arkansas Tech in Russellville. And we'll just go from there. And it's just a, you know, there's no cookie cutter meeting or anything. It really is more about where you are now to where you want to be. Um, We do a whole lot, though, in business compliance issues, regulations. You know, do I need a business permit? Do I need to charge sales tax? Um, You know, what do I need to do to do that? And, and so we, we do a lot of that, and we do have some checklists, some other things like that. So it just really depends on what the person needs. Awesome. Incredible. Well, I think there's definitely some people listening that I know that need to reach out to you and start that mm-hmm. relationship because it brings a ton of benefits. Uh, Rhonda, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It, I think you've added a lot of value to everyone listening and myself as well. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>